Hey, hey, what's up, guys? It's Jordan with the Lauder Bad Resource Podcast. This is show 120, and I am pumped here today because today we have a fellow laundromat YouTuber following Keenan joining us on the podcast. I'm super excited for you to get to listen in on this because Keenan is doing some incredible things both in his laundromat and also outside in other kinds of investments. We get into a little bit of that also. So very, very cool episode today. You're going to love it. If you're not following following Keenan on YouTube, if you're not subscribed to his channel, make sure you go subscribe to following Keenan. You get a little bit of the insights of what's going on in his business. The link to that and the link to everything else we talk about today will be in the show notes at laundromatresource.com slash show 120. So make sure you go subscribe to following Keenan. You're going to want to after this episode. Anyways, it's so incredible. And uh, real quick before we jump into it with a following Keenan, I want to get to today's fast lane tip, which is this. Did you know that Laundromat Resource has the number one Laundromat community out there? There is. So If you are interested in growing your business, if you're interested in getting into this business, the best way that I recommend is get in a community, get around people who are doing the things that you want to be doing, who are thinking about the things that you are thinking about in terms of growing your business and stuff. The best place, in my humble opinion, to do that is the Laundromat Resource Pro community. And not only that, but, uh, you know, uh, on a recent podcast episode, we had Ernesto and Barbara join us uh, with Kalari and Mardell Agency, and they do geofencing. They were incredible. Tons of great information. I know a lot of you guys reached out to them uh, after that episode, but they offered a $300 discount on their services, which just about covers an entire year's worth of the pro community as we speak right now. So make sure you head over there and join the pro community, get that discount along with other discounts. I think we're up over $3,000 of potential discounts for pro community members there. If you want to check those out, check out laundromatresource.com slash pro because you get access to those uh, discounts. You get access to all the tools and resources, which we are about to uh, explode on, by the way. There's a lot more coming your way for the pro community members over there in a very short amount of time. I'm very excited about what's happening over there. Beyond all of that, probably the biggest thing and the biggest key to your success, the biggest key to your growth is getting around other like-minded people. And that is where a bunch of us are gathering at the Laundromat Resource Pro community. So go check us out over there, laundromatresource.com slash pro. Check out everything you get access to over there. All right, with that said, uh, let's jump into it with following Keenan because we have an incredible discussion today with him. Let's do it right now. Keenan from following Keenan, the man himself. Thank you for coming on the show. How you doing, man? Good. How you doing? Thanks for having me. Ah, uh, well, first of all, my pleasure. And thanks for, you know, reaching out and making sure we got this thing together because it's been cool. I've been watching you on YouTube. For a long time, I know a lot of the industry has been watching you on your laundromat journey, so it's pretty fun. Hopefully, we'll get to talk about that a little bit. Uh, I'm doing good. Appreciate it. And uh, I'm I'm here waiting for summer to show up. Sounds like it showed up there for you already. Yeah, it's hot here already. Yeah, it's still, still cold here. It's in the like 60s, which is like winter weather here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, why don't you give us a quick background on you? Who are you and, and how did you get into laundromats? Yeah. Uh... Basically, I I, uh, had rental houses. And in college, when I was 19, I was buying rental houses while I lived in a fraternity house. And I I got through the lawn, I got through all the rental houses, the that that part of my life. And what happened was I got married, my wife and I, we just didn't have enough time for rentals and are very management intensive, especially single family. And we started looking for something else to buy. And so we were looking for commercial property triple net, something we could rent and sit back and collect rent and not have to do a lot of work. And um, basically through our journey, we looked at mini storages, laundromats, car washes, uh, strip malls, I mean, we, part, big apartment buildings, 130 unit stuff. We looked at all of it. And this one property came along that had two, two additional rental office spaces like a thousand square feet each then you had the main square foot that was a laundromat it was like 1200 square feet and we both looked at each other we said we don't know anything about laundromats let's just buy the building 
if it works, we'll keep it. If it doesn't work, we'll rent it out. And so for 70,000 bucks, we bought this building. It appraised the day we bought it for 210. And that's how kind of we got started. And we just, we literally just turned the laundromat on, left the equipment was there. And all of a sudden we realized it made money. And then we dumped more in and here we are. Well, Three laundromats look, later and. <laughs> Listen, I've seen your channel. And it's a little ironic to me that you were looking for something passive and you ended up with laundromats. Not that they're not, uh, they're not, they're not, they're, <laughs> they're not, not true passive. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, but they are, they are, they do take less time than, you know, traditional business. So, uh, pretty cool. Okay. So you were, you were basically looking for any kind of investment that you have found and you sort of stumbled onto a property that had a laundromat and that's how you got into it. Yeah. Oh, and it, the funny thing was, is we had passed up another laundromat a year earlier that I could have bought for 28,000, the real estate and everything, because it was in a gun and knife club district that I call it. Okay. And I was afraid of it getting broken into. And that's where everybody, but I wish I would have bought it now. You know what I mean? It's really close to one of my other stores. I wish I would have bought it, but I just didn't know. And I couldn't even pronounce the equipment's name. Like it was hips equipment. Yeah. I'm sitting here trying to pronounce this to laundry <laughs> concepts up in Chicago. And they're like, Oh, it's hips. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, yeah. just, I had no idea what I was even looking at. Yeah. None. Yeah. Well, that is the funny thing about hips is I'm all, people are always trying to tell me like what equipment's in their stores or store they're looking at or whatever. And I always just assume it's hips, no matter what they're trying to pronounce. Cause <laughs> usually just hips. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that's kind of funny that, you know, you, you passed one up. That was, you said 28,000 for the real estate and the laundromat and everything. Yep. Oh, so you gotta realize I was buying this stuff in 2010, 2011. So we're coming out of the recession yeah. right before the recession. I saw things coming and I sold all my houses. Mm -hmm. So in 2006, 2007, just before it hit, I unloaded houses at four or five times what I even paid for them, even more than that, to tell you the truth. Um, and so then all of a sudden we hit that recession and everybody with a business had it for sale. Every car wash in our town was for sale. Every mini store. I mean, people were just scared. So these laundromats, they really had, and they were, they needed to be retooled. So right. they were all run down. And so the, the people weren't making money. So they were scared. So, yeah. Jeez. Well, nowadays that's like two 60 pound machines or something like that. You know, 28 grand. Good grief. Yeah. yeah. I just put 12 machines in a laundromat. It was a little over a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Jeez. Insane. Yeah. yeah. The prices have really gone up and, uh, you know, especially over the last couple of years, it's been, it's been wild. Um, yeah. okay. So you passed that one up though. And you said it's in a gun and knife district. That's what you call it. That gun and club, gun and knife and gun and knife club districts. What gun I call it. Yeah. District. Okay. So rough area is, is that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. But you have one in that area now. Pretty close. Yep. Okay. Okay. I'd I say mean, I'm probably three blocks away. Okay. I, so, I mean, do you run into a lot of issues there? No, not really. Okay. Um, I do get some, I've had some vandalism, but it's mainly been, you know, drug addicts, you know, trying to break in a train machine, that kind of thing. Yeah. But maybe over 15 years, maybe like four incidents so far. Okay. That's not too bad. Not too bad. No. Yeah. Well, and that's a good, that's a good, uh, leads to a good question is when did you, buy that property with the laundromat. How long ago was that? Yeah, that was 2009, 2010. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you've been in it, been in it a while here. I like that. Um, <laughs> all right. So you bought that property. You basically, you said you just opened the doors and. Yeah. We like see what we went to the closing. We went to the closing the day before we bought a bag of quarters from the bank uh -huh. and we knew the old lady that it was a the situation was an old lady owned it, or older lady owned it. Her husband had died. He ran the laundromat. She didn't know what to do. So she just wanted to unload the property. They actually had it listed for 130. We got it for 70. We walk in the, after the closing, she closed it that day, which pissed me off because I had all the utilities in my name. She closed it. She said, my lawyer says I have to close the business legally for a day, whatever. So we walk in, take the tape off, put quarters in lady walks in to use the laundromat, puts money in the change machine, gets money, walks out the door and drives down the road. That was our first customer. <laughs> so that was our experience. You know, that's what we did. So. Well, I got to uh, tell you, it's 
better than my first experience because I walked in the very first time and there was a lady completely naked uh, oh, doing wow. all of her laundry <laughs> in the washing machine. That was I was like, what did I get myself into? So nice. Um, yeah. Uh, so that was my introduction there. Okay. So you, you bought that thing. Okay. So the customer walked in, got changed, left, uh, which is pretty common and pretty frustrating, actually pretty frustrating for a lot of laundromat owners, you know, especially when there was a quarter shortage and all that stuff. Holy cow. That got really frustrating for a lot of people. Um, but, uh, I mean, how did it do initially off the bat? Off the bat, it didn't do too bad. I, you know, I think we were making, you know, seven, 800, maybe a thousand bucks a week which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a small demographic area. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it paid the bills and made some money. I mean, it was until we retooled it, it really did pretty good for being run down. Yeah. So did you have to do any uh, like advertising to get people in there or you just kind of ran it as it was? <laughs> Ironically, I don't do any advertising and I, that's probably one of my downfalls. I just went in there and I just gutted it real quick floor paint ceiling new machines and just open it back up and word of mouth took off and they came they came the people that left had come back and the people that were using it kept using it so yeah that's awesome well dude when the field of dreams method works it works man i love that yeah. uh two how- liner on busy streets which helped and this one isn't on a busy street it's if i was literally like 100 feet closer to this road i'd probably do quarter more business or five, 10% more, but yeah. 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 And that visibility is important. Uh, yeah. How long was it before you retooled that store after you bought it? Well, we did it in several segments. So when we retooled it, we actually put new washers in the first week we owned it and but we kept the old dryers. So, okay. And then the next time we did it was about five years later, we did all new dryers and then just now we put all new washers in it again. So okay. about, about every four or five years, seems like we've been doing stuff to it. Yeah. Yeah. And just keep keeping it feeling fresh. Yeah. How's it doing these days? Good. Does real good. Yeah. Does real good. That's awesome. Do you, do you, this is a little bit of a side note, but I was just curious. Do you highlight one of your laundromats more than the others in your channel or do you try to get them all? They're all in there. Okay. Video footage you're seeing is from all of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The yeah. the short that's like blowing up right now that's up over three million views. Um, uh, that's why my channel's growing. There's I it's a dumb short. I'm cleaning out a lint tray and literally it's I think three point seven right now million views just in the last lint tray. just in the last three days four days maybe. Yeah, and that's on my one I built. So yeah. What what are we doing wrong over here? I, that I don't know. Just... <laughs> it's crazy. That's so funny. That's what I got. I got. I actually have a guy that films, and I have an editor because yeah. I can't do all this. So they're coming in in two weeks, and I told them, I said, "We're going to make a whole bunch of lint videos." Yeah, and all kinds of lint videos. We're yeah, all I want to kinds... see like a big pile of lint. You should save all the yeah. lint between now and then, and just do a, like a huge pile. Like this is a week's worth of lint, and then I want to see yeah. you, like diving in it or something. Yeah, people find it more interesting the stuff we find in the lint. That's yeah. that seems to be the big thing. But yeah, that's so funny. It is. And yeah, the internet is a great wild, wild place. But <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. I love to hear that you're you know cleaning out the lint and three million people are watching you do it and yeah. you know it's it's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, okay, so you bought this uh, this property, had the laundromat, you just kind of flung it open, you did sort of a partial retool and remodel, um, on this thing. And, uh, so after that, did you, were you like, okay, I want to go out and find more laundromats or like, what was the, what was the process after that? After we got the first laundromat we ran it for a year, we knew we needed to get another one. And, uh, my wife really wasn't big on it, but I said, I'm going to find another one. And there happened to be another one that the people wanted out of. And so we we're I was probably, what, 2012, about that time. So people are still pretty down on themselves. And we found one where these two guys just couldn't work it out. And we bought it right away. So, yeah. How far is that away from your first one? I would say it's about 10 miles. So we're in a, a metropolitan area where there's a big town. And then you got like four or five little towns that 
Like you can't tell the difference, kind of like California, you can't tell the difference yeah. when you leave one to the other. And so they're kind of in each of those areas, plus that main area. So I think our total population here is 120,000. Okay. I mean, that's a good, that's a yeah. good uh, area. Do you know how many laundromats are in the area? There's seven and I own three. Nice. Are you trying to scoop them all up? I get as many as I can sometimes. Yeah. That's what I'm talking, yeah. about. What I'm talking yeah. about. I yeah. fast up a few because they're they're really they're not worth even buying. And the people that did buy them are already losing their butt. But uh you gotta watch not buying them in certain areas. So like out of those eight, two of them are junk. Nobody. And then the other two, two of them are my dealer. So okay. I'm assuming you mean your your machine dealer. Yeah, the, the Speed Queen dealer. Okay. They own two of them in our town. I just didn't want you to get in trouble, you know, with ambiguity on what kind of dealer you're working with. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Distributor. Yeah. Uh, so, well, can you talk about that for a second? I mean, you said two of them are just in a bad area. What what makes them a bad area uh, for them to be in that you knew, like, okay, these aren't really going to be worth it. Well, the problem, the problem you have is if you, how do I explain when, what I do in my business is I don't go anywhere. There's not a McDonald's, uh, dollar general, uh, um, Casey's is a big gas station around us. I don't go anywhere. There isn't those three things. Okay. And the reason I do that is because if you go into these neighborhoods, like, like a ghetto or a rough neighborhood, the hood, whatever you want to call it. The reason there's none of those businesses down there or in it is because they can't make enough money to pay for all the crime and all the, the stuff that's going to happen to them. And it just isn't worth your headache. Now, I have one that's right on the edge of um, a bad part of town, does really well, doesn't get doesn't get burglarized or nothing. But it's also a block away from a McDonald's, you know, so that's if you're looking for like where to put them or why not to put them places, I go where the professionals go, where your, your demographics going to come to you. They're going to drive out of that area to use you. But I don't, I don't go in those, those laundromats are in bad areas. If that makes any sense. Um, yeah, I know. I think that makes great sense. I mean, I think that's a great technique is to, Hey, you know, these, these bigger, you know, franchises and corporations and stuff, they put a lot of time, money, effort, you know, skill into finding the right places right. to put their businesses. So, you know, as a laundromat owner, you could do that too, or <laughs> you could just you see use their people theirs. to work for you. Yeah. That's basically what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which is, which is a great, a great technique. And, and you mentioned a lot of like really good uh, ones, you know, the dollar stores, you know, the fast food restaurants, McDonald's, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Walmart's are another kind of popular one, you know, stuff like that, that, it's, you know, number one, you know, it's going to be making money there. And number two, it's the right demographic of people. Those are similar right. demographics. Uh, you yeah. Know. Near an auto parts store. If I can find a, a, a fast, like a McDonald's, an auto parts store and a dollar general, that is the trifecta of the neighborhood you need to be in because the people that go to those three stores are using your laundromat. So. I love that. I love that. And my best stores buy all three of those. So kind of tells you. Yeah, that's that was great right there. I love that. That's great. <laughs> uh okay, so you so you said about a year or two ish later you yeah. went and you, you found this laundromat. These guys couldn't make it work. What were they? I mean, do you have any sense of like what what were they doing wrong that you were able to do correctly? Uh the problem they had was they went into it, they were friends, they were realtors, and their pr plan was one would be the money guy and would do all the bills and financing and all that part of it. The other one would do all the work, whether it was hiring person to clean, fixing the machines, fixing the building. That's what they would do. What ended up happening was the one partner that didn't want to really get his hands dirty was so lazy. He didn't even want to manage the money right. And so the other guy, his name was Derek. It was um, Matt and Derek were their names. And the Derek guy he got so frustrated because his buddy Matt didn't ended up not doing anything. And so here he is carrying all the weight and he, and then what happened was he fell out of love with it. So then he quit repairing it. He quit fixing it. I mean, somewhere I've got pictures of this place and I mean, there's ceiling tile falling in and 
the floor's all peeled up and the machine, there were Waska mats. They were like Gen 2 Waska mats, the square door ones or three or whatever they were. Bunch of broke Maytag top loaders. I mean, it was bad. And so then they weren't making any money. And then they were just, I mean, obviously they were done. Yeah. And so, yeah. And the, the one guy, Derek, once he saw I fixed it up, it took me 30 days. We ripped everything out in 30 days, put a whole new laundry mat right back in. He couldn't believe what it was like. It's the same and, place. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because his, his infrastructure was pretty good. He had some issues like they had. I'll give you an example behind the dryer wall. The dryers were hooked up on power strips. <laughs> so the electrician actually put boxes at every dryer and he had two plugs. So each dryer, because they were stacks, uh -huh. each dryer had its own plug. But what they did is they decided not to use that and they'd plug a power strip into one and they'd run five dryers off a power strip. And these power strips were all black from burning up. Yeah. And he couldn't figure out why the dryers weren't working, why they were tripping breakers. I go, but that that's what I ran into, you know? Yeah. So, so. I mean, it sounds like it was just mismanaged and the partnership doesn't sound like it turned out to be a very good one. Yeah, uh, it was them. bad. So, so you went in and you put in all new machines. Did you, did you do a total retool on that one? Or what did you do for that? I, well, I got lucky speed queen had repoed a laundromat out of North Carolina in that time period in 2012. And it was actually a showcase store in one of these big housing developments. And I got all the machines that were like two years old, considered used, but they're really new. They'd never even, they'd never even really been run. So that's where my washers came from. Dryers, I ended up keeping the dryers they had because they had good hips dryers. They just needed to be redone. And I redid them, got a few more years out, and then we went and bought new dryers. So did you find yeah. the the repoed uh washers through your distributor? No. How'd you find those? Oh, my distributor, he he's kind of a shark. Um uh Mark's his name. He works for Hermes. I'm sure you've run into these guys. Um they he found them. Um, I the dealer net the way the the way the equipment dealers work is Speed Queen, whoever repos the equipment gets first choice. And so if you don't choose it, then they put it out on their server for all their other uh dealers to pick up that equipment. Well, my dealer knew that I was building a laundromat and another guy was, so he went out and grabbed all this equipment. It was basically it was a laundromat in a truck. And um, so that that's how we got all that. And then obviously he's making money off it and speed queens getting some money back, but I got a hell of a deal. I think so. That's all you care about. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you get the deal. Yeah. I mean, the washers are still there and they're actually still running really well at this point. And that's the one we're actually considering. Cause I've got, I've gone to touch screen on one of my laundromats now. And I really want to take that other laundromat to those washers as well. So, yeah. So are, are you, I'm just kind of following rabbit trails here with you as you're talking, because you're just so much good stuff, but are you, are you loving the, uh, the touch screens? Yes. Yes. And there's, it's, it's the dumb reason is those stupid overlays, the stupid sticker overlays. My customers, if they get a little crack in it, they start peeling that thing. Mm -hmm. And here I got 130 bucks in a sticker. And on the touch screen, you don't have that. Yeah. And the only downfall with the touch screen I could see is somebody damaging that screen mm -hmm. and it costing you two, three thousand dollars to buy this thing, whatever it costs. I don't even know. Um, but uh, as for the pluses, there's just so much more to it. They're so easy to program. They take a minute to program. You can do um, which we're going to is uh, Speed Queen's app pay. So we're going to do coin and app pay instead of cards because I think cards are a dinosaur. So we're going to go to that. And I just, you can look at them on the internet. You can free vend them from home and it's all integrated by the company that built the machine. I mean, that's what I love about them. Yeah. And I mean, what's the response been from customers when you put those? those oh, they love them. They love them. And then the people that speak Spanish, you know, you can push a button and it all turns it into, into Spanish. So they can read it all. And then it defaults back to English if you want. I mean, it's just amazing what they can do. Yeah, it definitely so, like unlocks a whole lot of things that we couldn't do before. And it's one of the, you know, one of, one of the new technologies that has been introduced that I think will be a big deal. It's starting to become a big deal. It will be a bigger yeah. and bigger deal as we 
you know, figure out more ways to utilize this stuff to help us run our businesses better. So yeah. Yeah. one thing I did with it is has a, it has a lucky vent feature, which all the old machines had the lucky vent feature, Right. but the new ones, they'll display a big star and say, you're lucky you get a free wash. So it's kind of like a casino machine. Yeah. Well, I, don't, I don't tell my customers about this. Right. So they think and this is psychology, uh -huh. but I'm actually getting customers to think they're ripping me off because this guy doesn't know his machines are giving out free washes. So the word of mouth around town is if you go over there, you might get a free wash. They have no idea their machines dishing them out. <laughs> so I'm actually gaining people because of that. And it's all because of that touchscreen because the old machines, you couldn't do it real well. Yeah. Now, it's, now it's awesome. Yeah. I had that on my old machines and I did the same thing. I didn't tell people or anything like that. And every now and then I'd be there when one went off and, you know, sometimes I could see customers like, you know, like trying yeah. to like hide or, you know, whatever. And sometimes, uh, you know, there'd be customers would be like, Hey, I think something's wrong with your machine. Cause it didn't say lucky wash or anything. It just went from, you know, whatever the vent price was and you put right. one quarter in and then it just went all the way down to zero and just started. Yep. And so they didn't know what was going on, you know, with yeah. that. And they're like, Hey, I think something's wrong with the machine. I'm like, no, you got a lucky wash. Like you, you won. But having what that I was, screen is awesome. Tell yeah, me. see, I'd love to add a light to it and then make it like a casino noise. Yeah. I think that would even draw them up more. Yeah. People like that. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, you know, there's Las Vegas is built on that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, okay. So you bought the second one, you retooled a bunch of it. Uh, how, how was that one after you retooled it? I mean, you said they weren't making money before bought it how long did it take you to start you know get to break even or about three weeks about three weeks and we had it it was just it was crazy the amount of turns we were doing and stuff in there um to give you an idea that laundromat we had horizon washers brand new they were 2012s yeah 2012s um if you know much about the bearings on them the bearings are supposed to last about five six years that laundromat was so busy. We were burning up bearings in those in a year, year and a half. Jeez. Because, and when the Speed Queen dealer came out, they said, you know, your warranty, technically, we we're supposed to look at the amount of turns this thing's had. And they looked at it and they go, the turns you've done in a year, we wouldn't expect this machine to do in five years. But it was just, people were just flocking to them. So it was, that was a great one. But it was a better location. It's on a busy road. It's next to those three things I told you I like. McDonald's, the auto part, and the, it's actually Family Dollar is literally right across the street. I mean, it's you can't get better than that location. So, so well, okay. I mean, is it all location? Like, what? Listen, you, I mean, you got to spill the beans here. Like, there's you're you got a you've got a laundromat that's doing the number of turns that an average laundromat would be doing in five years. You're doing it in one year. Like, is it all because of location? Is it because there's just no competition? Is it Cause you're so good looking. Do you have like a, <laughs> it's, it's a combination. you posing on the machines <laughs> in a speedo or something. Like what did you do to get all these people coming to that laundromat? Well, what I did with some of it was, is some of my price points were like maybe a quarter less per washer, something like that. But it was mainly location in the fact we fixed it up because the other two laundromats we were competing against, you know, one was in a bad location the their machines they couldn't count on their machines running the other one the other one had nice equipment but it was also off the beaten path i mean so mm -hmm. it's it really is a lot with that location so man got to go back to that you got to repeat what's the trifecta you said an auto parts store you got McDonald's, have, like, dollar McDonald's general. auto parts store and a family dollar or dollar general or you know, there's i think there's another one uh, but i can't think of the name of it okay but, yeah Okay. Dollar Tree. That's the other one. Dollar, Dollar Tree. Tree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those three. You can find those three. Find a, and this used to be a chicken restaurant. That's the even funnier part. <laughs> and so it was a chicken restaurant that had, had gone defunct years ago. And restaurants are the best thing to put a laundromat in. Why? Is the other thing. Because you have three phase. You have the big water lines. You have the big gas lines. I mean, it's already set up for hard use i mean that's that's why I, I like them yeah okay well no i mean i think that's great so really we have a quadfecta we need the mcdonald's the auto parts store the dollar whatever 
and it needs to have used to be a chicken restaurant. So yeah, an old restaurant of some sort. That's the magic, magic form. Yeah, I, I look for three phase because like a lot of people, like if you're starting out and you're looking at used equipment, and this is a trick, and I got two machines sitting in a garage right now. I got two 80 pounders I bought and they came out of California. And I think they're 2010s and I paid a thousand bucks a piece, but they're three phase and nobody know, nobody has three phase anymore. So if you buy old buildings or you get in an old building or old laundromat that has three phase, you can get cheaper equipment right out the gate and get yourself going at a lower price point. So yeah. Hot tip right there. Hot tip. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so you bought this thing. You said it took about three weeks to get uh, yeah, to get to that break pretty, even. That's crazy, yeah. right there yeah. for a laundromat that wasn't making money before. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. Um, okay, so that one took off. And how do you know how long? You probably don't even know this, but do you know how long it was until that one overtook your first one in terms of how it was performing? Uh, right off the bat. Oh. I mean, it, it was the first right month or two, moment. we already knew this. It was such a better location. It was doing one and a half to two times the amount of money we we're doing at the other location. And it yeah. still is that way. I mean. Yeah. Dang. Okay. That's cool. So dude, that trifecta, write that down. If you're listening to this, write down that trifecta, quadfecta really, but it's trifecta. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, all right. So you got the second one. It went straight to the moon basically, which is awesome. Uh, doing crazy, crazy turns. Uh, you have one other one, right? Is that? I've got three. Yeah. You got three. So, okay. So when did that third one come into existence? 2016, here? I got the third one. Okay. And what happened was, is between 2012 and 2000, well, 14, 2014, the economy started to take off. So you couldn't find anything for sale now. And so in 2016, I got so impatient. I go, I'll just build a laundromat. And so I found another restaurant that had been closed for years. It was on a corner of two busy streets across from a stop and rob. And it was near the gun and knife club district. And we decided to build one and uh, it turned out really well. Um, probably wouldn't build one again, just because I don't like building them from scratch. I'm not, if, if I would market it more, it would be better, but yeah. So that's what happened. 2016, we ended up that one. Okay. So uh, what made you decide to want to build? I couldn't find any for sale and I wanted another one real bad. And now I got impatient. And if I would have just waited like literally like a, a year later, the one that I told you about uh, earlier about that I could have bought for 28,000, it was near my other store. It came back up as a repo again. This time they needed 50,000 and I should have bought that instead of building the other one. I would have been better off, but. Yeah. And That's the reason like, I say don't build them is because if you're going to build a laundromat, like if you're like the Wilford brothers where they go out and they just fucking spend God awful amount of money and they, they market and they, they love interacting with people all the time, you'll be successful. But me, I'm not, I'm an introvert. You know, I don't, I marketing is my Achilles heel. Like I suck at it. And so if you build a store, you better be really good at marketing and get that because you're, you're, taking people out of a habit they used to have and trying to give them a new habit. Well, that's hard to do. And so if you buy an existing laundromat, they're in that habit. So it's like the Starbucks. There's a Starbucks every day and they don't go here every day and go here. And if they go outside that routine, they get upset. Well, if you buy an existing laundromat, they're still going there. People are still going there, even though it's a dump because they love something or they love that routine. If you can make it nicer and buy that place. You'll have them. And that's, that's kind of my, I guess if that's a tip for people starting out, do not build a laundromat. Do not go find a rental space and slap one in because I think you'll fail more than you'll succeed because you're going to have to get people out of their routine. If you can find a zombie mat and retool it, I think you're far better off than building one. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we talk about this a lot, but you know, laundry, laundry is a habitual chore, right? A, a rhythmic yeah. chore. And it's kind of like driving, right? Like when you're driving, like after you've driven for a while, a couple of years or whatever, you can basically drive on autopilot, right? You're not thinking right. about, okay, I need to put on the blinker. Okay. I need to check over my shoulder. You know, all that stuff just happens automatically. Right. And right. that's part of 
how our brains work to make things easier for us to, to handle. Right. And laundry right. slips into that mode where people don't think about it anymore. Even if there's a nicer laundromat, sometimes that you just built, they'll keep going to the other one. Cause they don't even really think about right going to another one. And so one of the things you got to do in that situation is you've got to do something dramatic to snap them awake, right? Like snap yeah. them out of that habit and get them doing something different. Uh, but uh, easier said than done. And like you said, when you build new, everybody who's going to come do laundry or who you need to come do laundry at your laundromat is currently doing laundry somewhere else. So you've got right. to entice them to come to yours. So it is, there is some, there are some obstacles definitely to overcome uh, building versus buying. Uh, yeah. So that's a good lesson learned. How, what was the process like of actually getting it built out and everything? Like, what do you mean? Like, like was, was it difficult? Do you hire contractors to do it? What was that all? Uh, okay. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'm old school. I had a lot of sweat equity. Um, well, I pretty much, me and another guy, we did it all. I mean, I poured the parking lot in concrete. I did the sidewalks. I hired a glass company. I was my own general contractor, I guess you could say. But um, me and two other guys, we gutted it. And I installed all my own machines and had another had another person paint. But I did hire, I, like I said, I did hire the electrical workout and uh, some of the plumbing workout. But I did a lot of the other stuff. I cut the floors open and dug the trenches for the pipes. And yeah. That's what I like to hear. Way to get after yeah, I really it. Got, I really get into it. It's great. I got equipment so I can do it. I got excavators and, you know, tractors and uh, dump truck and yeah. Ah, how long did it take you? Took us, I think, three months to get that one done. That's pretty good. How big, how big is the space? 2,400 square feet. Ah, that's pretty good. That's pretty yeah. good. And it's cool because in the videos, I, my ceiling's black in that one, and I, I probably shouldn't have painted it black, but it's actually a precast concrete deck above the building. It was a it was an old convenient convenience store, so it's built like a like a vault. I mean, it's it's just everything's concrete in it, so people can't tear it up. The ceiling, like I said, it's probably like twelve feet up, maybe fifteen feet, and it's got steel beams holding it up. I mean, it, it's just crazy. I love the building. If my my really good location, if I could take this building and put it in, in that location, I would be unstoppable because the way I built it out and the way it's built. So. Well, you know what you did wrong on this one is that it used to be a <laughs> convenience store, not a chicken restaurant. That's, right. You, you yeah. missed. So yeah. You miss on that one. <laughs> it did have three phase though. Okay. Okay. Well, did you add the three phase or it already had it? Already had it. Okay. Convenience stores, a lot of old convenience stores have three phase, so it had it. Okay. It had the two inch gas line, it had the two inch water line. So nice. Okay. Okay. And that one you bought. I'm I mean, I'm assuming you bought the real estate and just yep. built it out, built it out from there. Okay. Yeah. And you bought it specifically to put the laundromat in there? Yes. Nice. Okay. The whole build uh, out, the whole thing cost me this is 2016 money. Cost me about one hundred ninety-eight thousand. Jeez. So. Well, you probably couldn't even put machines in for that, huh? No. Yeah. Jeez. But I mean, I bought I bought used machines because it was in a rougher area. But then I just replaced all the known parts. Like I replaced every drain valve, every sensor. I just replaced everything I knew would be a hiccup. And knock on wood, they're still going pretty good. But yeah. Yes, man. And you can keep a lower vend price. So that was my marketing idea. You know, not trying to be a low price leader, as people call it, but, you know, trying to entice people to go there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, that's, that's awesome. And 198,000 for a whole build out. That's pretty. Yeah. I don't know. We don't, we don't deal in numbers like that around here much. No, I know. Uh, <laughs> You're probably half million to a million. Well, yeah, at least probably. I, I mean, I was looking at building out an ADU at one of my properties here in the ADU that was going to be like 600 square feet was going to be a $200,000 build out. Uh, you know, so I was like, wow, gosh, man, that's craziness. Uh, so I still might do it actually, but uh, yeah. Okay. So you, you built out that one. I mean, how is it, how's it performing? It sounds like not as good as number two. 
It does. It, it does good as number one. It, it fluctuates. Okay. And so, yeah. I think what would improve it is if I bought new dryers. We're put, what, what our plan right now is, is because that's our store that's kind of like our, not a redhead stepchild, but it's, you'll, have, if you ever get multiple stores, you'll have a store that never want to put brand new stuff in because you just, you just know it's going to be really beat on. And if you get a brand new machine and they beat on it, you're upset. But if you take a machine that's five, six years old from another store and you put in there, well, you've made money, paid it off, and now it's making you money and it's not so bad. Well, that's what we're going to do. So one of our laundromats, we're probably going to, the one that has the touch screens, washers, they, they have 2018 75 uh, pound dryers in them. So we're probably going to take those and move them over to that store and then buy new touch screen dryers for the first laundromat. So, yeah, well, and that's in part of the, I guess, perk of having multiple laundromats is you do have some flexibility where you can do some stuff like that, mm -hmm. where you can move equipment around if you need to and be a little strategic about how, you know, yeah, if you're not real busy at a store, like say one store, you put a bunch of 80 pounders in and they're just not doing well, you can move it to another spot, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you know how to do it and have equipment to do it. You know, I know a lot of people wouldn't try to install their own right. machines or something, but if you have that capability, because the installations, man, they can, they can get expensive on you real fast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So you, you built out that third one. It's doing about as good as the, as the first one fluctuating you've got the uh <laughs> called it your redhead stepchild which i thought was funny yeah uh okay and and that second one is killing it which is awesome uh which, which one of the of the three gives you the most headache or any or any of not maybe none of them um i would say the first one but it's it's more of a headache i None of them give me a lot of headache. Like I've gotten it to where I've, I've, I've really dialed out all the problems. Um, my biggest problem early on was I had horizon washers and yes. I am, oh, God, I, yes. I hate horizon washers. I, I don't care what a dealer tells you how speed Queens improved them. And I love speed queen equipment. I love hips. I love Unimac. I love um, the speed queen. Ipso. I love it all, but I hate the horizon. They need to throw that machine away and never ever talk about it again. And when I had those in two stores, every time I went on a vacation or I went to do something, this machine won't lock. Yeah. The, the it's full of water. It didn't it didn't wring out my clothes. And and, yeah. and and the problem with that is everybody wants to be compensated at that moment in an unintended store. That's hard to do. Mm -hmm. The minute I threw them away and I put a few top loaders in one store and put some new washers that were hard mounts, problems went away. And that's Really, that's really been my biggest problem is those Verizon washers. If I had to own those any longer, I was done. Um, I just couldn't do it anymore. I had the same issue. And in fact, my first store, I the, the distributor basically, he, when he laid out the store for me, and I had no idea. I made so many mistakes. I had no idea. But the majority of the new machines I bought, I think I bought like 12. It was like a 1700 1700 square foot store, like 12 of my new brand new machines were all the horizon washers, which yeah. I thought was awesome. And you know, it, it's just not like people try to jam those things full and they just don't do well when they're full and the yeah. door latches. Soap are all over. Yeah. Soap everywhere. They, oh my they start gosh. rusting because yeah. they're junk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're so bad. Door I, locks. I had so many problems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just throw them all away into a landfill yeah. or I think speed queen made, I, I really think the engineers and, and I joke in my videos about Ed and engineering at speed queen. I think he designed the horizon to make Maytag feel better. I really <laughs> do because there's nothing worse than a Maytag washer than a horizon washer. I mean, it's really, it is the bot is bad. <laughs> oh. I hope there's not really an Ed in engineering at Speed Queen. He's gonna. I don't know, that. but I joke about him. People give me a hard time my videos, but <laughs> I think they sat around in the conference room and said, "Hey, I know we're doing really well. Let's figure out how to make a washer that's completely crappy, and that way we, you know, we have one bad machine." Because uh, every year people buy them, and people are still buying them. And my dealer's like, "Yeah, they've improved them," and I still hear the new ones, same complaints. It's like people can't handle using, like you said. 
they they overload it. I have people that come to my laundromat with sticks and they'll take my hard mounts and they'll take that stick and they'll shove those clothes up in there. I have videos of this. They can handle it. Those things, no, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, and what I found happens like people will try to like jam the stuff in there and then they try to like jam the door closed. Those little plastic latches snap off. Yeah. And yeah, like, oh gosh, there's just so many. I, I had one one time. I couldn't figure out why it was leaking. Like I had changed the door gasket seal and everything, and it still leaked out the bottom. That piece of glass, you know how it has that weird shape to it? Yeah, yeah. What had happened is they had loaded it so heavy that when it rotated, it took the glass and turned it at one point in the cycle. Oh. So the bottom part was on the top pushing the door out. So it leaked all the time. And we didn't even realize until we took it out to throw it away. We're like, well, that's why it's leaking. And you could actually still turn it because it had loosened it so much. That's yeah. No. Awesome. I think we should do a whole, we should just do another whole episode just on trash and horizons. That'd be a lot of fun for me. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I don't know why they make them. I haven't figured that out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know why people buy them is because they're the cheapest cheap. option. You know, that's the reason yeah, cheap. people buy them. And my first ones were 1600 bucks a pop. Yeah. Mine too. Something like that in the 1600 buck range, 1800 bucks, something like that. Uh, now did now did your dealer try to talk you into the tax thing where you could get a ten thousand dollar credit because you were yeah. ADA compliant? Yeah, yeah. You know that's completely wrong. I never saw a dime of that, but well, you could take this credit. That basically, the, the, what the dealers were doing, and I think Speed Queen told people to do this, and they said, you know, there's a there in the federal government, there's a, a line item for a ten thousand dollar credit if you have to bring your business up to ADA compliance. And so my dealer was telling me, he's like, well, you bought these washers. You can take $10,000 off of this $20,000 bill. So I did that on my taxes and my CPA, he started questioning it. I got audited two years later and I got to sit in front of the IRS agent and ask him about this. And they're like, no, that's not how that works. And I'm like, you son of a gun. I So I always wondered if other dealers told people that because I see it in the forums all the time. Oh, you can get a credit. It's actually, people need to know that's actually not right because the way the credit works is if you have a business like in California and somebody comes along and says you're not ADA compliant mm -hmm. and they file a, um, a notice that you have to become ADA compliant, that's when you can take the credit. Not just going out randomly buying some washers. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, yeah. So I've seen that because I had a parking lot in one of my properties that didn't have, you got to have like the handicap spot with the yeah. extra space on the side of it. And I didn't have, it was a small parking lot. I didn't have that. And I got a notice. And so I was able to use it for that. But yeah, my tax guy was like, mm, this is not, this doesn't qualify. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So Right. But dealers used to tell people that. So yeah. yeah. Anyway. Can't always believe what you read on the internet. You can't always believe the people who are trying to sell you something. <laughs> Those are two great lessons that I have learned in my journey. Both yeah. very expensive lessons for me. Uh, what what happened with the IRS? I mean, did they just make you pay tax on that or what? Yeah. Yeah. I, ironically, I made a video a while back about the IRS. I actually get audited every couple of years now. Mm -hmm. I get audited a lot because between my wife and I and our laundromats and our farming and that, we... We generate a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so we get, we get dinged every year, every two years. Yeah. We, we actually, last year, we just got out of one that was for three years. They were ordering us on three different years. And our, and then the, the agent told us, he goes, Hey, by the way, in 2023, we're going to go ahead and manually look at your taxes again, just to make sure. So when you turn your taxes and nobody looks at them, a computer does stuff. When I turn mine in, People, they actually pull it out and they look at it. They physically go through mine. It is crazy. Listen, the IRS knows shady people when they see them. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, you see, what it is is these laundromats. Yeah. When you start depositing the kind of money that, you know, I, I'd hate to see some of these bigger guys with 30 stores, you know, to give you an idea, I mean, I can generate eight to $10,000 a week. Mm -hmm. Gross. Mm -hmm. Pretty easy. So you start doing some math and you get $10,000, 40,000 a month, $480,000. You think about it as an individual, I'm touching in my hands before the government ever sees it, $480,000 in a given year. And then you try to tell them you got write-offs and then the money starts disappearing on their end. You know, 
Yep. Then that, that's what happens. So yeah. that's not a life lesson for these young people or people getting into it. You know, there's three things. My parents, my parents were in real estate. They built homes and all this fun stuff. And they told me when I was a kid, they said, there's three businesses. If you ever buy, you will get audited relentlessly. Car washes, mini storages, and laundromats, because those are the three that are known for laundering money. Mm-hmm. They're the three big. So. Yeah. Well, and, you know, no shortage of money laundering jokes in our industry, uh, <laughs> mostly from people outside of our industry talking about our industry. Right. Um, like we've never heard that before. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think that's, that is, uh, I mean, that's real, right? It's, yeah. um, you know, the, it, because it's, you know, cash, you know, the government wants to keep track of that and make sure that you're not doing anything shady. Now it's easier said than done a lot of times, but you know, when, once you start making deposits, cash deposits, $10,000 or more there, you know, the bank is required to even, uh, you know, record that manually, uh, at right. the bank there too, and report that from their end. Um, also, and, and they need to verify identity, all that stuff. So, uh, you know, they, they take their money pretty seriously, uh, over there at the IRS. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good story too, is like my first year on my first laundromat, like my first laundromat had the two rental places. So we made money on that. And you know, we only paid 70,000 bucks for this property. Right. And the two rental places were each bringing in six, 700 a month. So I was what little loan I had on this thing, I was able to pay it plus my bills. And I would, I would save mistakenly instead of depositing every week, I would save the money from the laundromat and take it in like every so many months. And uh, I remember one time I walked in with $24,000 in cash and the bank got big eyes and they go, okay, we'll take nine and you're going to have to come back later. Like you're not doing that today. And then they explained that rule. Like I had no idea. I just thought it was my money, I could deposit it. So we have to break up weeks. We have to break weeks up into every couple of days because of all that red tape they go through. Yeah. It, it's it's so funny that this that's how this works, right? It's like, it's your money and yeah. it's the bank. It can't like, you're supposed to be putting stuff in the bank and, and the bank won't even take money. You know, it's so yeah. crazy, but that's, you know, that's the reality of, of dealing with cash and that much cash. Like you try to deposit a $200,000 check. No problem. You can do that. Right. Right. You try to bring in 20 grand cash. It's a problem. problem. They, they get the big eyes and sometimes they won't take it. Right. Yeah. Which is just wild. Uh, just wild. Uh, all right. So you bought these uh, two laundromats, you built out a third one. What's the plan going forward? Are you are you done? Are you calling it quits here? Are you gonna look for more? Are you gonna try to take over your town? What's the deal? I think my plan right now is because I'm in I'm in the three corners of this area. Like like my my theory is I'm trying to do like a Walmart thing. You know, Walmart isn't necessarily in every part of your town, but Walmart is so well known, everybody goes there. Mm-hmm. So my plan now is to take my laundromats and make them like like people will want to go there. Like they'll pass another one to get to me and make it like a Walmart. So make it so that there's a lot of value for them to be there. Like one laundromat, we're going to put an arcade in, but it's going to be practically for free just to draw customers in. Um, We had another one. They were going to try to put a bar in at one time, but that's kind of fizzled out. But that's kind of my plan is to make them so that people want to be there. Kind of like a Bucky's or a Walmart. That's my plan. I don't know what a Bucky's is, but I do know what a Walmart is. And- okay, well, Bucky's, Bucky's is a gas station chain down in Texas and Arkansas, and it's it it has. It's known. It's it's marketing philosophy as the cleanest bathrooms in, uh, in the world. Okay, and they have attendants in their bathrooms. Okay, but Bucky's is like a big store. It's like a Walmart. You can buy a grill there. You can buy pickled eggs. You can buy uh, a boat. I mean, you can buy all this stuff, but it's a gas station and it has a hundred gas pumps out front. I mean, it's, if you ever get down South, you, you got to stop. You won't leave a Bucky's without spending a hundred bucks. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> Maybe I won't but, stop at a Bucky's. But people guess. are drawn to it. People are drawn to it though. Yeah, It's yeah. crazy. So like Walmart, you know, yeah. people are drawn to it for a reason. They know that name. Bass Pro Shop, another similar type. Yeah. Of yeah. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. And I like the, I like the idea of making it a destination place, right? You know, whether that's like, Hey, putting in an arcade in or putting a bar in or a coffee shop in, you know, I I'm seeing more like juice shops, like that kind yeah. of stuff, uh, you know, making it, making it a destination, making it a place that you, you think about. And it kind of goes back to that discussion we were having earlier about, you know, when you, when you build a brand new store, you got to do something to snap people out of their habit and stuff and, and get in front of them. And it's the same thing, like making a destination and, and just be in front of mind when people are like, I got to do laundry. Well, yeah, of course I'm going to go, you know, to your laundromat because it's got a bar there, or, you know, it's got yeah. a, an arcade there that's free. And yeah. the kids are going to be able to do that stuff. And I'm going to be able to do my laundry in peace, you know, like right. making it the place to go. I like that. I like that. It's probably a great, uh, a great way to, take over the town too right? <laughs> and you know just that's a plan of, we'll see yeah that's awesome um have you been investing in other stuff along the way also or are you mostly just focusing on your laundromats i do i do a lot of other stuff i buy stocks and um the other thing where we, we do we farm i farm a, a little over right around 200 acres now um i close in two weeks on two different farms i just bought so if it all goes well, there'll be a third one. So I'll have another 150 acres, but I buy farm ground and I flip farm ground. I do some neat stuff with it at uh, one of the properties. So how are you? Okay. So when you say you farm, I, mean, I I don't think you're actually out there with a hoe and a rake and a tractor or, or are you? Are you Combine tractor. Yeah. Plant, I planted this spring and I have some videos on my channel. I don't post a lot of them because it's kind of mixing the channel up, but yeah, I do farm it. I haul stuff to the elevator and I have companies that spray for me. And Okay. How are you, how are you, how are you farming like 200 acres? Farming's pretty easy. Once you get it down pat, farming's like a, I'm going to be what they call a two by two farmer, two weeks in the spring, two weeks in the fall. And the rest of the year, you really don't do anything. Okay. And so, so like farming, if, if there was passive income, farmland is real passive. And then farming is semi-passive because of how it works. Huh. So if I, this is, this is probably a bad conversation for me to have. Cause I get very like a uh, shiny object over here, but yeah. if I go, let's say I go out and buy some farmland. Once I kind of get it figured out, I could, I could like mark off like three weeks twice a year and and just say okay i'm gonna go farm these three weeks and then the rest like the water's on automation sprains hired out yeah there's no um, water here we don't irrigate but yeah i mean it's pretty much on on autopilot from there well we don't and have so right now i'm on summer. autopilot till i hit october okay and then you go and harvest and what are you yep. farming corn and soybeans uh this year we're going to plant some pumpkins for i've got a couple different uh pumpkin stands that are going to take pumpkins from me so in our off ground, like stuff we don't use for corn and soybeans, like near a pasture and woods and that, we're going to plant some pumpkins for like decoration. So. Okay. Well, okay. I, I don't want to go too far down this because that's well, fine. But I I'm so curious. Okay, so you harvest your corn, corn. You harvest your soybeans. What do you do with them? Well, on one farm, I have a grain bin, so I can store them. The rest I can't store. I take to an elevator, a, a place where they I sell them to. Kind of like you sell pop cans to a scrapyard. There's there's a place you sell this commodity to. And then they give you a check and then put that in the bank. Wow. But see, the beauty of farming and laundromats. See, this is another thing. And I've told my wife, I said, like, we have a grain bin. We can fit 10,000 bushels in this grain bin. Now, 10,000 bushels of corn could be anywhere from 60, 50 to $60,000. Well, if you have your laundromats... And you're paying yourself and you're able to pay your inputs. I can leave that corn in that bin. I'm not paying tax on it. Mm. And whenever I need a little money, I just take a load out, take it to the place and sell it. So see, that's kind of what we're doing. So our laundromats don't have enough write-offs, right? But I can go buy an eight, uh, $20,000, $30,000. I buy used equipment. So my combine will only cost twenty four grand. But that's a beautiful write-off in my taxes for my laundromat income. Okay. Okay. And not having to buy more laundromat equipment I don't need. See, I'm buying something else I do need. Yeah. 
No, I I love that. I love. So okay, that's what we're doing. How how long does how long can you just put corn in a? You can store it for probably five six years pretty easily, as long as you keep it dry, and you keep the outside temperature the same as the inside temperature of that bin. And there's fans that run; they're automatic. They all work off Wi-Fi now. But <laughs> okay. And like so, one year I dried down beans and I make money because if you take beans that are too wet to the elevator, you get docked. Well, I can put them in my bin, dry them down. I made an extra, I don't know, three, four grand just by a couple hours worth of work. It didn't cost me probably 400 bucks. Uh, so it, what, it's kind of cool how farming works. Once you what do they do it. with dry corn? Is that for like feed for animals or cattle feed? That All our corn is yellow corn. It's going for cattle feed for out West somewhere. Our soybeans are heading either to China or Brazil or wherever. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. Well, now you just gave me something to do for the rest of the day after we finish up here. So I'm going to go. Well, you think about it, dude. I don't realize I got the laundromats and then I farm, right? Uh huh. I work a regular nine to five job. What? And you have a so YouTube I, channel. I work for what the government. So I, I work in the government and I have a regular nine to five job on top of all this. Oh my gosh. What do you. I love, I love this. This is, I'm like, see, I got the laundromats, so they're pretty passive. Like I have a person that cleans and checks on them during the day. And I have another person that changes them out. And so we got that covered. And yeah. So I'm so inspired right now. I'm feeling like feeling amped up. Like I'm not doing (laughs) enough with my life. I need to do more. Uh, Okay. All right. Well, before I, we have a couple of segments of the show and I want to get to in a second, before we get to that, I, I want to ask a little bit about your YouTube channel and for anybody listening, you got to go, I'll put a link in the show notes or in the description. If you're already on YouTube uh, down below to following Keenan, cause he's documenting his experience with the laundromats. And uh, like we've already talked about, he's got some videos that have got some crazy views. So definitely go give him a follow, but what made you decide to start, filming about your laundromat. laundromat. Well, I, I, I actually started filming my farm and stuff real early on in 2009 because I figured, figured people would find it interesting that, you know, I I didn't even know how to farm. I just started doing it. And I didn't really do it a real well, so I kind of dropped out of that. And then, then I said, well, I'm, I'm going to show people my laundromats and my rental property I got left and see, see what they think of this. And it was doing okay. And then Brandon's video took off. And when Brandon's video took investment off, investment joy for anybody who doesn't yep, know investment joy, when his video took off, then all of a sudden the next day I had 2000 subscribers I had 3000, then it just blew up because people were binge watching him running out of stuff. And then they were jumping onto me. And then all of a sudden I took off and I was like, perfect. And I kind of, my, my channel's main goal is, is it's, it's a little all over the place at the moment. We're working on getting it dialed down, but my niche basically is, I'm just trying to show people this is possible. Like I told you, I work three different things going on here. Anybody can do this stuff. You know, when I grew up, I wasn't taught to work for a nine to five place. I was taught to work for yourself and that's how you get ahead. And so I've just tried to kind of take everybody along. And some people find it entertaining to watch the daily activities. That's fine, but kind of just to give people an idea. And then, and then also to paint a picture too, because some videos, in my opinion, some channels out there are telling people, like you said, it's passive. You don't have to do nothing. It's so easy. It's easy money. It can be, but it's 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 a lot to it. You know, there's work. There's bad days, you know. Then there's the good days, you know. But that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Yeah, that well, it's and it's pretty cool because, you know, we were talking about this, you know, before we jumped on, but like whoever would have thought that, you know filming yeah. yourself, just doing your thing at the laundromat and, you know, like cleaning lint out of the lint trap, whoever would have thought that people would want to sit on their couch and, or on the toilet or wherever they are yeah. and watch, watch you do that stuff. But they do, right. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty yeah cool. One of the, one of the biggest things I can get for comments is people over in Europe. Um, they're amazed that there's laundromats in the United States because you're such a rich country and they've got so much money. People can't afford washers and dryers. And then, no, they can't, or they don't want to, or they they live in an apartment and they work remotely, or they're or they're traveler workers, you know. It's they just don't that it's it blows their mind. So it's almost that's entertaining to them. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and I know they're set up a little differently there. They have like much smaller washers a lot of times that fit like in their bathrooms or under the sinks. Yeah. And, you know, we don't really have a whole lot of that. There are some of those, but, you know, we don't really have a whole lot of those over here. Same, yeah. same kind of setup. So it is, that would be kind of interesting uh, for some, it, you know, cultural, cultural. Yeah. Thing. But yeah, that's, that's cool, man. Well, that's cool. And I mean, I'm assuming you're having some fun with it too. Is that, you enjoy yep. that part of it? Yeah, I I love it. I I really like I said, you have the bad days, but there's a lot of good days. And yeah. Once you get it dialed in, it can be really a lot of fun. Do do people at your nine to five job, like do they know all these different things that you're doing? The farming, the laundromats, the YouTube channel. Do they know about that stuff? They know about two of them. I've never I've never told any of my family or friends that I do YouTube. And the reason I never did that is because a lot of mistakes a lot of YouTubers make is, hey, I'm going to go get my friends and family to subscribe. They're never going to watch these videos. They don't help my algorithm. And I figured once I hit 100,000 subscribers, then I'll tell my family. You know what I mean? But until then, I don't tell nobody. So at work, nobody knows. And yeah, but they know about the other two. Nobody's found you yet? No. Oh it's amazing. Goodness. No. That that is amazing. I mean, maybe it's just because I'm in the same niche as you, but you know, you pop up on my stuff. Yeah, it's hard for people to find you if they don't know you're out there. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, and you're. Do you know how many subscribers you're at right now? I think I'm at thirteen thousand right now. Okay, maybe thirteen five or something. Yeah, so we're in the same same neighborhood. But you're you're gonna pass me because you're you'll, you'll pass <laughs> you'll, me maybe even by the time this thing comes out because. I'm boring. Like I'm uh, aside from these conversations, like I'm not doing anything. I'm not appealing to a wider population. And I know this, right? Like that's, which is fine. Uh, but I mean, you'll pass me for sure. And it'll, it'll be awesome. I mean, I, I'm rooting for you to hit that hundred thousand in the next year. But if you'll get there podcasts, surprisingly podcasts, they say podcasts is a better niche to be in than any of the others because there's a smaller amount of people doing it. And there's more of a demand for people to watch them. Yeah. Well, and I know YouTube right now just, just, uh, is our, they're pushing podcasts. They just started their own podcasting yeah. platform. It's they, yeah. So, it's a big yeah. trend. Yeah. So, but this is cool, man. I, I mean, it's cool to, you know, meet, I guess a fellow YouTuber. I, I don't know that I'm like pure YouTuber, but, and obviously you're not a pure YouTuber either. You got a lot going on. Uh, but you know, somebody who's doing something similar and finding success and growing, growing pretty fast, uh, too, uh, which is very, very cool. Um, okay. We've got a couple of segments on the podcast, uh, here. And one of them is called secret sauce and secret sauce is this. What's your number one tip for somebody who already owns a laundromat to help them improve their business or make things run smoother or make more money or, you know, anything along those lines. I would, I would not be afraid to have new equipment. That, that'd probably be the best thing. If someone already owned a laundromat and you're already set in a location is, is new washers, new dryers. If you don't have them. Do you, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to push a little on that because uh, first of all, I agree with you, but I'm going to play a little, not devil's advocate, but I want to hear you expound on that a little bit. Right now, as we're doing this interview, equipment's more expensive significantly than it was two years ago, and interest rates are higher. Yeah. Do you still think it's a good idea to get new equipment if you have to get a loan? If you had to get a loan, depending on what your old equipment is, here's, here's, here's a trick that I use, and it's called trading up. So if you have really nice used equipment, in that market you said that's so pent up in demand. Well, if new equipment's got a pent up demand, then used equipment has a pent up demand. So I would suggest to somebody, see what amount of money you can get for your old stuff. And that'll help you pay down the cost of that new stuff. Mm -hmm. And two, evaluate your laundromat. Like me, I found here back when I bought dryers a few years ago in 2018, I priced a 50 pounder, 55 pounder, uh, 45 pound stacks and 75 pound dryers. 
And I found that you could buy a 75 pound dryer $1,200 cheaper than you could buy the either two because nobody was buying those. Now my dealers thought I was nuts, but I put them in, my customers love them because they're huge and you can load them all day long and they, they do great. So there's niche equipment out there too to find, you know, like, like who in the industry tells you to buy a 30 pound hard mount washer? Probably nobody. You know, they all push the 60s, the 80s, the 120s. You know, that would be my trick if you're going to buy this new equipment is, is find a machine that's not too much smaller or whatever, but it's, it, it may not be as mar like they're going to sell it to you cheaper. And then to find out what you can do to unload your equipment you got. Because even my junk that I was taking out my horizons, I was tending them to the scrap yard because I didn't want to give them to anybody. And I had people begging me to sell them to them. And I go, this is nuts. And people were paying, you know, five, six, eight hundred bucks for these pieces of junk, you know. And like we talked about, there were sixteen hundred to start. Mm -hmm. Well, that's half the cost of buying a new one, you know. But people see that big dollar and that little one, they'll go, "I hope I'm saving," but they don't see the headache, the work, the maintenance. So that's kind of what I would do as a trick, you know. That uh, that's some savvy wisdom right there. I love. Number one, the trading up idea, and then number two, the actual niche equipment idea. Those are that's two that's two secret sauces for the <laughs> price of one right there, uh, which is good. Uh, awesome, awesome secret sauce. I actually want to just for funsies uh, do secret sauce number two. But in farming, uh, let's say I want to go out and buy some farmland. What's some good secret sauce for getting started in farming? Okay, let's say. Let's say uh, I one of the pieces of ground that I'm buying next week um, that I'm closing on, it's uh, 53 acres, okay? Yeah. Now, when this deal's done, I'm going to get the farmland for free, okay? So this is instead of getting a free laundromat. Right, I'm talk, literally, talk about that here. What, what do you mean? Yeah. So what I'm doing is, is it's, it's, and I wish I had a picture of it, but it basically it's got 24, 25 acres of woods that is buildable. It's buildable land. Well, this piece of land, I drove by it. I literally made an offer the day the realtor was putting the sign up and I had him be my agent. So we had the dual agency, which was perfect because then he's fighting for me also. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell off that 24 acres that I don't want, but he had this land at such a price point. It was 87.50 an acre. So I paid 462,000 for this 53 acres. There's 23 acres tillable that I'm going to get to keep. I'm actually going to get to keep 30 acres of this land. So about 54 um, is the total. And what's going to happen is these two chunks, these two 12 whatever acre chunks, I'm going to get 210, 225, maybe if I'm lucky, 230 for them because the market is so hot. And this, once again, this is how people don't think is nobody can go out there. People, well, nobody can, but People will go out there, they'll look at that 53 acres and they'll say, I can't afford that $462,000 price point. Like you said, interest is high, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I've got lines of credit that are higher than that, so I can go out and get it. They'll look at that $200,000 or that two twenty five dollars or that two thirty dollars for 12 acres and go, that's a deal. I can afford two hundred thirty, dollars and they'll buy these off me. Well, then I got four sixty dollars there. I'm paying 462 and you're probably saying, well, that's not completely paid off. Well, the neat part of this was this farm was planted already. So there's 23 acres of soybeans sitting out there that I now am going to own because I worked it out in the deal that I get the crop. So that's going to bring me $14,000 in income. Mm -hmm. So by the time you take the 14 and my surveyor cost off, I'm basically coming out ahead. My dog's going to bark now in the background, but <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. Well, no, yeah, that's... So that's a trick. That's a trick to, it's basically flipping farmland and then I'm going to end up with 30 acres for free. Yeah. And and maybe even getting paid to take that 30 acres. Yeah. And buy make a few bucks. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Which is awesome. That yeah, I'm so glad I did farming secret sauce. This is good. This is <laughs> going to be like a new segment. I'm going to ask everybody. What's your farming secret sauce? And you'd be like, I don't know. I don't farm. And I'm like, come up with something. All right. Cause I'm interested in farming now. Uh, okay. We have another segment. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing that. Uh, we no have problem. another uh, segment called pro tips. And this is what's your number one tip 
for somebody trying to uh, buy, we'll, we'll stick with buy their first laundromat since you said don't build for your first one. So what's your number one tip for somebody trying to buy their first laundromat? After, after my first laundromat, realizing that there's people out there that own these things that are just beside, even my second one, that people are beside themselves. What I would do is I would go look for a rundown laundromat. I know it sounds crazy, but I would go look for a rundown laundromat that's that is in those areas with McDonald's and the Dollar General and that that they've fallen out of love with. And if you can't get them to, you know, some people go to the landlords if it's a rented space, but it may be that situation if they've completely vacated it and it's just empty. There's some in our town that are just boarded up. You can go to that landlord, say, hey, look, I'm going to make you some money. It's a very good tip. I know there's people out on the internet that teach this and there's yeah. the DVDs and all that stuff. And, yeah. but that's, that's what I would do. I, cause there are so many people that fall out of love with real estate and they, they're just desperate to get rid of it. Houses is one right now. A lot of people want to get rid of the single family houses. They're tired of renting the tenants. They're tired of them getting tore up. Well, what's going to happen is down the road, this cycle, the cyclical cycle is going to come back again. And then they're going to be worth a fortune. You know, it might take you a little while, but that'll come back. Just like the laundromats. When I bought these things, you couldn't give them away in 2012, 2010, 2009. Now I'm getting people calling me all the time going, will you sell your laundromat? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's crazy. And then when I tell them a price, they don't even, right now, I, I had one the other day. I was willing to sell two of them for 600000 And they're like, they didn't even balk at it. They're like, okay. I'm like, that's insane. I didn't even pay that for all that. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, so that's come around now. It'll go back the other way. We'll dip back down. So. Yeah, no, that, that, I think that's great. Uh, a great pro tip for people is go, go out and find you yeah. know, something run down and, and make something. Get, of get there own. before the realtor gets there even. I mean, cause the realtor, the realtor's job is going to really be to dial that property value up on them. And so if you get there, that's what Brandon from investment joys talks about. If you get there before the realtor, you know, you can cut out that commission and. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, just for anybody who's interested in that, we have a, a free uh, letter that you can go download, basically um, and make it your own as a template. If you want to either mail that to laundromats or uh, take it with you when you go talk to an owner and see if they're interested in selling. Uh, we found it to be super effective uh, there. Awesome pro tip. Uh, I mean, can we do a, can we do a farming pro tip? Oh, uh, let's, see. Like, let's say I want to get involved. I, I do now. I'm, I'm excited. About it. I want to become <laughs> a farmer. I want to go buy some farmland. How do I learn about farming? I if a pro tip. If you want to be a farmer, I would go work for a farmer. And I would, and I would, I would go work for him a couple of weeks here and there. And then that would, that would get you kind of your foot in the door to understand what you're getting yourself into. I love that. that. Would, if you we were trying to get into farming. I love that. I grew up on a, but I would farm. go back. To, I'd go back to the secret sauce. If someone wanted to own farmland to get started, you want to find something you can flip and do, you know, and what, get to that point. What do I, let's say, let's say I was doing the deal that you're doing. Okay. But I know nothing about farming really. And I don't have, like what equipment do I need even need to get started in that specific deal, the soybean field deal? You need a combine and a bean head, or honestly, you could actually hire other people to pick it for you. I mean, you could you could literally be a share crop farmer where you know you're you we call it custom farming. You can hire somebody to plant it, you can hire somebody to pick it. You just lose a little bit of the income. So, you know, you might pay 30, 40 bucks an acre to have it planted. You'll pay 130, 140 bucks to have it picked and taken to the elevator. So as long as you figure that in, in your business model and your income, you know, you wouldn't even technically need to own equipment. Seems pretty reasonable too. Yeah. And some people do that. Some That's what a lot of guys do. Some guys will actually work for another farm or borrow their equipment. You know, I mean, that goes on too. And they get paid a little bit helping them. So there's... There's a lot of different avenues in that. All right. My wife's going to be mad at you. I how guess. I got started. How I got started was I basically just, my, my mom had passed away and I had some land and I always wanted to farm. My grandfather farmed and he retired before I was the youngest grandchild. He retired and was gone before I could ever get into it. And I had this land 
and I had some money and I go, you know what? Screw it. I'm not going to live much long. You know, I'm not going to live forever. I'm going to do this. And if I fail, I keep the land and I rent it back out like I was doing. And what I did is I took 30 grand. I went and bought a tractor, a planter, combine, the, the head that goes on it, a wagon. And that's how I started. And then I paid for itself and, you know, the land I already had. And yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just figured wife. you only live for, you don't live forever. So you got, you got to get off the pot eventually and just do stuff. I mean, what, what's the worst going to happen? You fail. Well, you've already failed if you haven't even tried. All right. I need a second because I got to write that down. Not going to live forever. <laughs> so you got to get off the pot and do something. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. And yeah, such a cool story. I am, I don't know. I'm so pumped up. I, you know, my wife is going to be mad at you. I just need to warn you because now I'm going to be looking at farmland. She's going to be like, now you're looking at farmland. What's your deal? Uh, but, you know, small you price know, you to pay for wife. being on the podcast. <laughs> well, I'll give you another weird one. Um, you said your wife was a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, my wife was a teacher before she quit. Now my wife is an indie author. She's a self-published author. That's what I'm talking about. And she loves it. And so how's she how's yeah. she doing with her uh her does she sell books? Oh yeah, she's she's been on the Wall Street Journal top seller, USA Today. Yeah. What kind of books does she write? She writes adult romance and motorcycle club books. Uh, the one book uh, is called Ravage Me. Her, her pen name's Ryan Michelle. That's but awesome. yeah, she quit, she got tired of teaching and and she and this funny story. She got tired of teaching and she asked me one day. She goes, "You love everything you do. Everything you do, you love. Like you don't hate any of your jobs." I want to do that. And I said, well, you got to find something you love and just do it. And you'll be the most successful person in the world or to you, you'll be very successful. Yeah. And so she started writing and it took off and now she's like, I love it. And so, yeah, she basically, she's like, she learned from watching me. And like she said, like I told you before, you know, a lot of people are taught to work nine to five and then retire. And then you have social security, but I wasn't taught that. So I was taught to go out and, accomplish something and have it generate this income for you. That's this unsubstantiated dead income that just generates over and over. So good. You'll have to, uh, you'll have to send me a link to her, her best book or something. And we'll include it in case anybody wants to pick it up. That'd be fun. Uh, okay. A fun little thing there. Uh, that's, that's cool. Yeah. And and my well, wife is into a lot of things. Yeah, you guys are all you guys are all over the map. I love it. Yeah. You're you're uh you're online, you're like as down to earth as it comes when it comes <laughs> to farming, you know. You've got the laundromat thing going, you've got your right, you know, author in the family. I love this. I yeah. had no idea that you guys were just so dynamic. It's so good. Uh yeah, and my wife has been, you know, kicking around the idea of of not teaching anymore and she was going to take a year off this year. And she ended up deciding not to, you know, to try to figure out. Cause I was like, well, what do you love? Like, what do you want to do? And she's, you know, she's struggling to pin that down and, and figure that out. So I think that's the case with a lot of people are trying to figure out, you know, what do I want my life to look like? And what do I want to do? What do I spend my time doing? Uh, right. That is a challenge uh, to overcome, but it's something to worth putting some time into thinking about if you don't know what it is. Uh, rather than getting into that habitual mindless, this is just what I do. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm a big fan of, you know, be proactive about making life what you want it to be and not just letting life happen to you. Like go out and find out what you love to do and then just start doing it. Like right. you said, I love that. Great advice. This has been incredible, informative, oh. inspiring. I am like so pumped up right now uh, that I'm going to be going to look at farmland. And uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know, I got really excited about that. But man, Keenan, thank you for coming on the show. If you guys are not yet subscribed to Following Keenan on YouTube, go to uh, YouTube, type in Following Keenan, or check the link down in the description. If you're on YouTube now, or if you are listening to the podcast, go to the show notes and click the link, but following Keenan on YouTube, 
uh, showing you the inside scoop of his laundromats, doing an awesome job of it and very entertaining, very uh, fun and very informative too. You know, there's, it's one thing to talk about owning laundromats and it's one thing to talk about the strategies, but when you actually get to be in there in the laundromat, seeing it, it's, you learn, you learn in a different way uh, and it's, right. it's very helpful. So appreciate you putting the time and effort um, and investment into making that YouTube channel for, you know, for yourself, but also for the rest of us. And I uh, really, really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your experience with us. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Anytime, anytime. And, you know, we'll have to do some more stuff together. Uh, it'd be a lot of fun to do some sure. stuff on, on YouTube. You have to get like several people together and you get all kinds of stuff going on. That's what I'm talking about. I love that. I love that. Uh, Maybe right. we get Brandon on. Yeah. I, I, well, I just met Brandon a couple of weeks ago. And so we, we kind of kicked around the idea. So we, we need to do some stuff with Brandon. Maybe you, me and Brandon could all come on and get, sure. you know, get the YouTubers all together and, and do something live or do something fun. That'd be great. Cool. All right, man. Appreciate it coming on the show. And I'm sure we'll be hearing from you again, one way or another uh, over here. And obviously if you're on following Keenan, you'll be seeing him over there. <laughs>